Welcome to the NCDWI Guy podcast, where defenders of the Constitution assemble to prepare for courtroom battle, and firm owners gather to develop marketing strategies that will revolutionize the practice of criminal defense. Here's your host, the NCDWI Guy, Jake Minnick. Hello, fellow freedom fighters, and welcome to episode 65 of the NCDWI Guy podcast. On today's episode, we are joined by attorney Holden Clark. Holden practices uh, primarily out of Gaston County. He was a uh, public defender in the Gaston County Public Defender's Office for three years before going into private practice in 2017. Um, Holden opened up his own practice last year that concentrates in family law and then competency proceedings, um, does a lot of work on the criminal end with uh, competence uh, with, with clients that suffer from mental health issues. But for Holden, uh, there is a, a great um, uh, kind of project in terms of addressing mental health issues, a, a kind of great concern about addressing mental health issues, passion project for Holden. So on today's episode, we are going to be kind of concentrating on mental health issues, both in terms of members of the bar, as well as uh, for our clients. And again, for many of our clients on the DWI end, this is kind of a front and center issue and then the stresses of, of uh, the legal profession make it a important thing for us to focus on as attorneys as well. So Holden, it is a great joy to have you on the podcast to speak about this important topic. Well, thank you for having me. Uh, this is my pr passion project. Um, I love talking about it. You may have to shut me up at some point uh, because it kind of <laughs> just rambles out of me, but I'm here. I'm enjoying it. And I thank you for the opportunity to be able to share some of this stuff. Yeah, that, that's, that's the problem with us lawyers. We can't, uh, we can't figure out when to shut up. <laughs> but, uh, but I, I, never, I, you know, I wore the shirt. It says, uh, you want to talk about it. <laughs> that's awesome. a taco, want to talk about it. <laughs> no, so, that's awesome. I'm here to talk about it. I, I love it. Well, I, I think, yeah, to just kind of kick things off, um, you know, may, maybe to focus primarily on, um, on attorneys for a minute and, and kind of the, the, the members of the bar, first of all, what, what are some of the reasons that you believe that, you know, the criminal defense bar particularly suffers from depression, substance abuse. Obviously, this is a concern across the board for our profession, but for criminal defense attorneys specifically, what are some of the reasons that you think that this is a important topic to talk about? Yeah, this job's hard. Um, and it's a job that requires us to be constantly engaged. It requires us to be um, really digging deep into our own emotional reserves on a daily basis. And I think that's what makes it so difficult is that a lot of us are already predisposed to have some of these issues. We're perfectionists, we're overachievers, we're always looking on the horizon for that next problem to come around and put this whole big um, smorgasbord, hodgepodge, whatever you want to call it, of emotions into these folks that are constantly going. And all it does is sets ourselves up for, for failure. Um, we don't do a lot of self-inventory because throughout the day, all we're doing is running, trying to put out the next fire because not only do we really care about our clients, but we really care about covering our own butts. So yes. we never take that time to, to sit down and figure out how we're actually feeling because we're constantly in that fight or flight mode. Yeah, I totally agree with that. I think that that is a really important kind of thing to think about taking the time to do a mental health inventory is so low on the priority totem pole. It's just something that does not get addressed with regularity, that doesn't get you know, pushed to the top of the list. There's always so many fires to put out, whether it's something happening at your office, with an employee, um, with a client, you know, on your family end of things. I mean, there's all of these fires to constantly be putting out. We see people at the lowest point in their lives. There's so much stress that comes from that, so much stress that comes from what is a judge going to order my, you know, client to do. My client's looking at jail time, is looking at, you know, 
for, for, you know, I don't, I don't do a lot of these kind of cases, but for, for many in the criminal defense world, my client might go to jail for the rest of their life. And that's kind of hanging on, you know, on my, on my shoulders. Um, I think one of the things that's really difficult for attorneys that practice DWI cases regularly is the standard of kind of acceptable behavior is a little bit kind of pushed push to the to the envelope because when you're comparing yourself to clients it's it's easy to kind of say well I you know I feel like I've got my stuff together because you know my clients coming in they blew a 0.37 they're you know they're telling me they're drinking you know a 12 pack a day or you know a box of wine a day or what you know a pretty pretty significant substance abuse issue. And so, you know, my, my two to three drinks a day or my kind of regular drinking habits seem kind of to pale in comparison to that. So I, I think it also is a little bit of a dangerous place from a practice area perspective, just because when you're, when you're dealing regularly with addicts, it's easy to say, well, I'm, I'm kind of, I, I look okay com- compared to that. And there's this slippery slope that kind of goes into that into that path. So I, I definitely think for, for us as a criminal defense bar, it's something that needs to kind of remain front and center. Well, when you think about it, we are constantly in control of the addict's life, right? We're, we're there helping them, we are spending time with them, coming up with ways to um, help resolve whatever issues they have. So when we're putting it side by side with whatever we have, you know, oh, that's that's what happens to folks that have it a little bit worse than I do. That's right. what happens when, so I'm in control of this situation. Uh, nobody can take this control out of, from me because I, I know exactly what to do if this happens to me. And right. they don't realize as it slowly happens to them that it's getting worse and worse. Right. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And, and I think the other thing that is important in terms of just trying, you had mentioned trying to kind of put out fires and always being worried about, you know, am, am I doing this the right way? You know, have I complied with the, you know, ethical requirements? Am I, you know, complying with the law in terms of my advice and making sure that I'm doing everything kind of by the book? And I, I feel that so much of law school is really focused on where can you make a mistake as an attorney, right? There's a lot of the, you know, a lot of Ethics is discussed in almost every class. Obviously, you have classes specifically on ethics. You get tested on, on ethical requirements. And I think that there's this kind of bright line, well, not bright line, but there's this kind of line that is put in the sand of, you know, I want to, you know, make sure that I'm being compliant and doing everything that I can to kind of abide by these rules. And what, what's not emphasized, and it's not to say that this is really the purpose of law school, but what is not emphasized is, you know, don't just comply by the ethics rules. Don't just not have a substance abuse problem, but positively, how do you kind of live your best life? That's obviously not going to be a focus of law school, but, you know, on the, on the flip side of just avoiding a dependency issue, there's never this emphasis of what does it look like to have a thriving practice, a thriving life? What, you know, what, what would it look like to have this kind of flourishing that's just not a focus in our profession in terms of CLE hours, in terms of kind of where, where we are is it's, it's, it's very much, I would say, focused on, you know, here's what, here's what to kind of avoid as opposed to here's the best way to live. Do, do, do you get that sense or is that? That is a hundred percent right on the nail. And we spend so much time worried about what can happen, worried about losing everything that we forget to really enjoy that we are helping people on a daily basis yes. and we're doing what's good and what's right. And we focus so much on that negative side of what the, the law is. And we spend so much time in CLEs, just like you said, learning about these are the bad things that can happen. If we spent more time encouraging the, the great behaviors and the, the, the pro bono work and the, the opportunities to, to help folks, we would have a culture where it was okay to discuss quit living in that dark space all the time. So what, what would be some ways that attorneys can do that mental health assessment or inventory? What are some of the suggestions that you have on how we assess that need to just be able to look and, and reflect and try to figure out how our lives are going? What are our priorities? What does that look like? 
Yeah, first thing, you got to find your quiet. Um, and ever I need to not be able to talk. But having that moment that you set aside for your quiet to do that inventory is super, super important. Um, and then from there, finding out what you're doing in your big picture. Every day, how am I meeting my big picture? And what is my big picture? Um, next, you're going to ask yourself whether or not you're getting there. And are you happy about it? Are you sad about it? Do you not want to do it anymore? Do you regret it? Where are you feeling like right now? And as those feelings kind of turn to the regret or the kind of just I'm over this or whatever it may be. Those are good times to talk to somebody about it. The best people to talk about it with is, is other lawyers um, or with lawyers assistance program. Um, those folks, they know it in and out and they know exactly what you're talking about and they've lived it. They know the problems that we have and they know that we all think that we're the smartest people in the room so they can get past our own egos, yes. uh, which is half the battle. It is. Um, but once you find that quiet and you start doing that self inventory and not being afraid of whatever your self inventory tells you, you just, you got to understand that those are real emotions and you can't just pack them down. Yeah. I, I love that. I think that looking for your, quiet time is so important. We live in such a, you know, busy world, you know, every, every minute of every day is packed out with things. And I think as an attorney, because our life is our time to some extent at the, at the business end of things, we're selling time, you know, uh, I don't do this, but I know that many practice areas are still billing time. So literally you are making money with your time. Every second that you're not dedicating to your practice, you're somewhat losing money, right? I mean, there, there's this kind of trade-off that is going on. And so what does that specifically look like in your situation? How do you kind of b build in quiet in your life? Building quiet in my life has changed considerably since uh, I first started. I uh, started practicing law back in 20. 13, I believe. Uh, um, and I was married at the time. I've since been divorced. Quiet time looked a lot different then than it did as a single man for a little while. And now I'm remarried uh, and have uh, stepkids. So quiet time has considerably changed. Yeah. Um, quiet time now is sitting out uh, and enjoying the, the folks that are around me and just turning off the the noise of the phone and the, the TV and just kind of sitting there and enjoying what the moment is. Yeah. I, I think, I think that that's, that's super important. Yeah. I, I, the, the, yeah. So, sorry to step in here, but just to point out that, that, you know, turning off the phone because we live in this technology driven society where we're able to be contacted 24 seven, there are some real advantages to, to being able to work remotely and virtually but you never really are inaccessible and clients a lot of times know that unless you set boundaries, um, you know, uh, your team knows that unless you set boundaries. So I feel, I feel like that is definitely a more, an increasingly difficult thing to set those boundaries of when do I clock in and when do I kind of go off the clock? Absolutely. And a lot of times our, the Amazon world that we live in, right, has become the the click buy get um, right. world, and that is what our clients expect of us. And it's because they have real fears, and their real fears can be addressed in a moment if they send an email. Um, but what I've done is I've intentionally set set up do not disturbs on my phone. I, it turns on at nine o'clock and doesn't turn uh, back off until six thirty in the morning. Right. Um, and those those are my times that I'm not addressing anybody else's issues. I understand that emergencies can come in uh, late, but, you know, it doesn't seem like it's a lot of time, but when you set those intentional boundaries and I don't have to look at my phone between five and nine, if I don't want to, um, but I am intentional about this is the time that I am unwinding with my family uh, and the time that I'm getting up in the morning for myself. Right. Um, so I think that that goes back to setting that quiet time. Yeah, that that's that's definitely been important for me. The uh, the quiet time for me is generally in the in the morning. I try to spend some time uh, most mornings in either prayer or exercise, a combination thereof, doing some some reading. Um, 
but I, I think that having the, the, the mornings where I get up and have some time to myself, whether that's time, you know, during exercise, listening to a podcast at the same time, or uh, just sitting, sitting quietly in prayer is so helpful in terms of when the kind of craziness of the day begins. My, my wife and I have, have seven kids. All of them are 13 and under, and it's, it's mad sometimes in the, uh, wow. in the house. So if you, can't, if you can't beat the kids, if you can't beat the kids up, you're not getting quiet time. And when, when I get, when I kind of That's play right. behind, you know, for, if, if you don't get up early, there is a real kind of, it sets the whole day off in, in the wrong direction. I'm less patient with the kids. I'm frustrated when I come into the office. I feel like I'm playing from behind the whole day at the office. And it's really not because I'm off schedule or do it, you know, really kind of uh, late for anything. It's just, I never got that time to kind of, you know, be, be ready for the, be ready for the day, you know, have that quiet time in prayer where, where there's just kind of this centering that occurs and this um, ability to, to, again, have that mental health, mental health moment, that quiet moment. So I, I really do think that that is critical personally for, for having the right days. Cause when I don't get that, I definitely feel it and kind of take it out on everybody else in my life. <laughs> Set the music and it's got to be a good vibe when you're coming in and you're, you're boosting your mood and you're, you're working towards, I have something to look for today. You know, it, it gets you set off in the right part of the day. And you're, you're right that when you do that, you're not feeling like you're constantly just pulling your shadow behind you just to make it through. Yeah. And, and, and that, again, even to just kind of point out some of these, these kind of small, small pieces, but, you know, being intentional in terms of that, car time if, if you're able to not be on the phone with a with a client or somebody else during that kind of time in the car being intentional about that is is so mentally healthy i think it's so easy to turn on the um you know the news radio turn on the the sports talk or whatever it might be and you know maybe that's interesting and kind of keep keeps you uh, uh you know something maybe you look forward to in the car ride but if it's not really kind of building you up and fulfilling you you've got a wasted opportunity right if if you've got the uh the specific music that is kind of uplifting and sets the tone for the for the day or just nothing right just quiet for the 15 minute ride in and that's your that's your time to have to 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 kind of get centered and to kind of you know basically be like all right what 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 is my purpose for today what am i going to be working through there's a real opportunity for that you know very very special quiet time to go to waste so i i think that that's a really critical thing i think that so many times we're looking for where can i get this quiet time how can i find this and just making minor changes to our habits, you know, to just turning off the radio for 10 minutes out of the 25 minute commute could make a massive difference in terms of how do I feel when I walk into the office. And the point that you bring up brings up the valuing of that quiet time that it becomes that five, 10, 15 minutes, whatever you have becomes such an important part of your day that it becomes routine. And when you value it and you set yourself up for being able to have those quiet times, it, it just takes the whole day in a different direction. Totally agree. Yeah, totally agree. I think, you know, in terms of, you know, identifying this, obviously, first and foremost, we want to make sure that we are living a healthy lifestyle because if we're not living a healthy lifestyle, mentally healthy lifestyle, then we're, we're not going to be we're not going to be good employers. We're not going to be good colleagues. We're not going to be good attorneys for our clients. We're not going to be good for our family. Um, so we obviously want to kind of make that assessment for ourselves. Also trying to help, you know, our fellow uh, colleagues in the profession. And when we see somebody that is, uh, you know, appears to be not in a, a good mental space consistently, routinely, what are some of the signs and indicators either for ourselves or for our colleagues that we should kind of be on the lookout for? It's that pull away from the things that you enjoy. It's the um, not necessarily wanting to be where you are. It's the uh, not sharing the smile that you used to have. I, 
I um, actually told this anecdote to a, a young man who just started at the PD's office here and explained to him when I was a, a young PD, I would go into the office whistling every day because I was so excited to be there. Yeah. And after about six months, just the, the strain of, of the work, yeah. my whistle went away. And I'll never forget one of uh, my colleagues and my boss, you know, they were, they were picking at me saying, well, I guess you finally stopped whistling. And um, I was telling him that, you know, you should never let anybody take your whistle away. And the anecdote was more about, you know, when those times have come, you, it is, you know, when you're, you're walking down the hall and it's no longer sharing a smile with someone else. It's no longer asking how they are. Um, Those self-check things. Um, but also we realize that in our colleagues too. Um, it's not, it's not difficult to have that conversation with a friend. What's difficult about it is that we put this idea that it's not okay to ask. It's not okay to, to draw attention to it. But I was going through a difficult time. I've dealt with depression. I've dealt with medications and therapists and all the things that you could possibly deal with it. Um, and I'll never forget some of the times while I was dealing with that friends taking me to lunch and saying, Hey, what's going on with you? Um, how can we help? And those things, more than anything that I did, I did throughout trying to deal with depression, was more medicating than anything. Nice. Um, was just having somebody who would take me to a, a, a greasy spoon and and say, you know, I'm here for you. Uh, what can we do? What's bothering you? Yeah, I, I love that image of you know, don't let don't let anybody take your whistle away because I do think that we. I've kind of talked about in the past on the podcast how almost every attorney that I've ever talked to went into law school with really lofty intentions, a great purpose of wanting to become a lawyer, wanting to help people, wanting to make a difference in the world, wanting to better their community. And at some point along the way, it's so easy in that billable hour in the, you know, kind of grind that is practicing the law to lose those lofty intentions and then just kind of get sucked into the mire of, you know, everything being a struggle and a war and a fight and losing that mission for which you went into the practice of law. And so seeing that, and you know, you, you can see this in so many different members of the, the profession. We've all experienced this at one point or another where there are just, you know, difficult clients or difficult cases that, that really weigh on us. And the, the way that you wake up in the morning, go to bed at night is dramatically shifted from where it was days, months, weeks before. And so I think that kind of being able to recognize that lack of a whistle, so to speak, that kind of lack of, you know, that, that skip in your step, the smile on your face, whatever it might be, that is kind of, this is me at my kind of uh, best version of myself. And I'm just not, I'm not feeling that anymore, recognizing that. And then for the criminal defense bar in particular, I do think we're at a real advantage to take care of one another in a way that many other members of our profession are not because we're in district court every day. We see each other, you know, on a, on a very frequent basis. So when somebody is, is kind of acting off, it's a lot easier for us to recognize that than it is for, for many other practice areas where you just don't see other attorneys with, with very, very much routine. And, and let me step in there with a, a, a fairly sobering statistic. If you think about when you're sitting down in district court and you're usually there with between four and eight other defense attorneys who are ready and waiting for their cases, right? If it's four, one of those people is statistically likely to be suffering from depression in that moment that you're sitting there with them. You got eight, now you're at two. Um, So our profession is so profoundly um, dealing with depression that we sometimes mask over it a little bit because it's so typical for us to see but we all know the signs and symptoms and you're exactly right that the criminal bar also is kind of uh, in a better position because they're not necessarily adverse to each other uh, and they don't have to deal with, uh, with fighting with each other and being mad at each other about things. Um, They have a a very congenial relationship. Yes, that's so true. Other than competing for business, you know, we're here doing the same work, fighting the same things. Yeah, that's so true. I think that that's a great point. There is nothing to, nothing to lose by, you know, checking in on a colleague. And there's also nothing to lose by being honest about where you feel your mental health is. If you're asked by somebody else, everybody's 
from my experience, everybody in the criminal bar is very much looking out for one another, you know, one defense attorney to the next and prosecutor to defense attorney. I mean, there just is, is not really any, any kind of point of, of weakness or exploitation that would occur um, if you're open and honest about that. I, you know, that's, that's been my experience in terms of the relationship. So that is a real advantage point in terms of being able to find and address those issues. 100%. Well, in, in terms of kind of, you know, the importance of this on our relationships with our clients, I think that, again, from a, a DWI defense perspective, so many of our clients are dealing with um, substance abuse issues. There are so many uh, uh, people that have a addiction, whether it's to alcohol or drugs, that come in as clients, and that doesn't mean every client is that that way, um, you know, or, or maybe even the majority. But if if you do it, if you do it routinely, you're going to come across this a lot. And I think, in terms of being prepared to help our clients, it is really important for us to be able to give great representation to our clients, for us to be as mentally healthy as we possibly can be. Because I, I always I always like to say you can't. You can't give what you don't have. And for our clients that are going through these very difficult addiction, substance abuse issues that they're trying to get addressed, we have to have kind of rock solid ground in order to be able to uh, help them. And again, that doesn't mean we should now feel some sort of added pressure, but there is a real importance to, to, to focusing on your own mental health so that you can be there for your clients who are going to be struggling with these things and need every bit of support that they can get so that they can ultimately succeed, not really in the courtroom, but in life. It's hard to tell a client that you, um, they got to slow down on their drinking or whatever substance abuse habit they have and also cheers them a beer at the same time. Right. And, you know, they want you and they hire you to be a point of authority on how to make impactful changes in their lives. Um, so one of the things that I think that if we're not giving our best and we're not taking the opportunities to self inventory and to help each other and to, to talk about the real issues that we're doing, we're, we're not putting our best foot forward for our clients. We're not, um, helping them in any way, in every way that we can, because, you know, the law is a lot about what you know, but there's a lot about relationships that come with that. And that's not just with your clients. It's with the prosecutors or other attorneys that you're dealing with. And when you are kind of getting into those emotions where you can't um, resolve your own feelings or you're not willing to, to self inventory, then you can become a drag on your client, not only for his case or her case, but also for them and their own quest to become better because they're saying, well, this guy's got it all together, but he's still doing these things. So uh, um, you want to be a leader uh, by example, but also want to be a point of authority for them. Yeah, I agree. And I, I think that one of the challenges is in, in our culture, alcohol is somewhat glamorous, right? And I'm, I'm, I'm going to say this from a point of um, I, I love a good beer. L- live in Asheville. We've got a lot of great breweries, mm-hmm. but um, the, the culture really glorified. Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, it, it's, a, it's a good place to live as, as a beer lover, but the, the culture really glorifies alcohol and partying. And even within the profession, you look at a show like Suits and in like every scene, they're drinking alcohol in the office and, you know, toasting each other with, with whiskey or whatever it might be. And one of the things that just kind of, um, you know, s- stood out to me a number of years back is that somebody had given me a... Uh, a nice bottle of champagne and I, I don't drink champagne. So, you know, I just kind of put it on my, on my shelf, um, uh, you know, almost as like a decoration, basically. It was just kind of like, you know, this, I, I, I'm not really interested in drinking this, but it's kind of a cool looking bottle. And I don't know at what point it was that this, you know, kind of sunk in, but I, I realized, you know, so many of my clients come into the office and probably see that and it's like a loaded gun just kind of sitting there on the on the shelf a reminder of you know the the mistake or a reminder of the relapse that just occurred or maybe like a trigger of like dang that looks like a you know a great thing and so again i think just being cognizant of what a addict is going through 
um, you know, we, we clearly wouldn't have a bag of cocaine just like sitting up on the wall. Um, you know, when we, when we sit down with a, a client that has a drug trafficking, um, well, not really necessarily the trafficking, but a drug user, a possession of cocaine charge, we wouldn't have that sitting on the wall and expect that not to kind of produce some sort of mental reaction. So I think even in terms of just having a, you know, a, um, good environment in which to discuss uh, things with your client. That's just something to to be aware of. And, and you know, obviously since, since that time, I've kind of eliminated any, um, you know, alcohol from the office itself. But it's one of those things where I just think it's easy to overlook what a significant thing that might be for, for a client coming into the office. Absolutely. Um, it's it's difficult to kind of step outside because we want that, that me time, but it's, it's difficult when you're a leader in the community and that's what our profession is, is to realize that you're also setting an example. And that doesn't mean that you can't enjoy beer or you can't go out to eat to dinner, but you know, when you're, you're going out to lunch with your, your colleagues, um, doing that instead of after work drinks, um, it sets the example that lawyers don't have to do everything around alcohol, um, yeah. which can be kind of the, the thing that we run into is that every it event is, that we're yeah. going to, there's going to be alcohol at. So um, we just be more intentional about that, particularly in protecting ourselves. Yeah, I, t- I totally agree. Again, I think that there is, th- there's just a, a kind of glamor attitude about, alcohol. And again, I, I say this as, uh, again, I, I don't want to, I don't want to sound preachy. I mean, I, I love, I love a good beer. So I, I'll, I'll say, I'll say it from that perspective, but I do think that it's, you know, this, this, uh, this way of, of celebration or this way of kind of interacting with our, with our colleagues that is just so expected in terms of events and that type of thing. It's just, it's, it's good to be aware of that. And, um, you know, really again just trying to make sure that in terms of anybody that is not able to kind of partake in those type of events might be struggling with addiction to kind of try to meet them on on their own ground right to to make sure that people are feeling included um that that you know might have a substance abuse um issue because that's one of the things to avoid as as a a person that is struggling with a substance abuse issue is a place where there's just going to be easy access where everybody else is going to be doing it, peer pressure, um, don't want to be the odd person out. Just being aware of those things, I think is helpful. Absolutely. So in in terms of any, um, you know, kind of ethical uh, uh, implications of substance abuse and how we kind of might want to want to address this with, you know, our, our clients or within the bar, what, what kind of, um, you know, ethical implications are there when it comes to substance abuse? Alden? Sure. So that's, it's kind of a two part question. So we'll first tackle with our bar members. Our bar members are a lot easier to deal with. And I say that in that it's a hard conversation to have because it's a peer and it's someone who you respect and who you would never want to cause any problems with the bar. But the great thing about the way that, uh, the, especially the North Carolina bar works is if you have a problem, they're like vanilla ice, yo, they'll solve it. Yeah. Uh, they're going to give you uh, whatever resources you need. They'll get you um, to a, a program. And there is not this, this horrible, you know, you know, things that come along with admitting that you have some type of issue. They're going to be there. They're going to help you. They're going to put people in your life that will be there as a resource. So dealing with it as an attorney is a great issue. Dealing with your clients who have substance abuse issues or mental health issues can be a lot more challenging. Um, rule 1.6 on confidentiality tells us that we can only disclose certain things if, um, particularly if there's a life or death situation, and it's going to be imminent death, right? And you got to reasonably believe it. So now you're set there, and in a moment when a client discloses that they are thinking of harming themselves or others, and you know that there's different resources that we have for, you know, doing involuntary commitments or getting out an emergency resource. You have to make a split second decision on whether or not this meets the threshold of reasonable and imminent danger uh, of, of death or bodily injury. Um, and what, 
in dealing with this and kind of figuring out where to go with is my instincts say life is the, always the most precious thing. And we put whatever our ethics are second to that. Um, and my feeling is any reasonable person would put life as the most precious thing and then deal with the, um, the ethics of it. So I've kind of come up with this kind of formula that you do what you got to do in the moment and you disclose what limited nature you've got to disclose. Um, at that point, probably the most prudent thing to do would take copious notes as to why you did it, what was said, what was disclosed, and how you limit it to only um, potentially avoid the, the outcome of serious bodily injury or death. Um, and in doing so, yeah, you may lose a client. You may have to deal with uh, the barb if they make a complaint about it. Um, but at the end of the day, you're not losing a client permanently. Somebody's not losing their brother or sister. Um, you can walk away from that with your head held high. And I think that's what we all aspire to do is making sure that we're doing right by others. Yeah, I agree. And I, and I also think that the, you know, the, the bar provides great guidance on that. Again, obviously, if you're in a, a situation where it's a split second decision, you may not have the ability to actually reach out and um, consult with the bar. But I will say that I've reached out to the bar on a couple of different occasions with just a, a question, you know, um, you know, trying to understand the ethical implications. And I've always gotten a response back very quickly. I mean, it's, so it's, good it, about it. Yeah, they are really good about it. So it's one of those things that if you have a situation like that, um, you know, don't don't feel the need to just kind of um, make all the mental calculations yourself. Reach out to them on the phone, send them an email. I mean, they're really good about getting back quickly, especially if it's, they're, they're going to be able to identify it as a high priority situation. They've done a really good job during COVID, especially being out of the office with trafficking through those emails and getting you a response in a, in a quick and timely manner. And if, if there is time to really digest it and kind of make a calculated move, the bar is always going to have your back and they're, they're going to do a great job to explain to you how you can walk the ethical bounds and also make sure that you take care of your client in the best way. Totally agree. Yeah, totally agree. And I, you know, I think that the, you know, one of the things that you said a couple of minutes ago in terms of, um, you know, b being able to kind of walk away with our, with our head held high, you know, I, I do think that at, 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 again, in terms of this kind of idea of, you know, thriving versus surviving, when we are able to kind of keep our keep our clients' best interest at the you know at the at the kind of highest point of what is it that we're trying to accomplish again, I always feel like with with our representation at the office, one of the best um, one of the best indicators to me in terms of uh, you know a, a DWI representation is and, and and what we want to start I think tracking as a firm moving forward is how many clients do we have that are repeat offenders? Because there are so many situations where people that get a DWI are so much more likely to get a second. And the person that gets a second is so much more likely statistically to get a third. It's, it, you know, the, the statistics are really bad in terms of that, that kind of movement. And um, I was doing a podcast, a couple of, uh, uh, episodes back with Zeb Smathers out of Waynesville. And he was saying that, you know, one of my guidelines for, you know, did I have effective representation is, did this person ever get a probation violation? Because if they did, then that was probably a missed opportunity on my front. And I feel like kind of building that into our practice, it's, it's a, it's a strange thing because I, obviously the, uh, the, the bills are getting paid by, by people that are in the situation of being charged with driving while impaired or being charged with some other traffic or criminal charge. But I think that as we are trying to serve the best interest of our clients, we have the opportunity to sit down with them at this kind of life changing moment, this kind of impactful moment where there is a clear choice about, you know, should I continue on this road? Should I not? There's an openness and a vulnerability to making life changes. And so I think that we really need to kind of take that approach of, you know, I can walk away with my, with my head held, head held, head held high, because this is, I know that I'm trying to act in the best interest of this individual. I'll never forget. I was, um, I'll say I was in college at some point and I was working with my dad and he was in a, uh, 
lean manufacturing. And I remember him telling a client that if he was doing the best job he possibly could, then he would be working himself out of a job. And that was his goal yeah. would, to, would be to work himself out of a job. And that's kind of, I, I think of that every time I'm helping a client is my goal is to make sure you never have to look at my ugly mug again. Uh, I'll tell them when we're done with the cases, I hope the next time that I see you is out and you're eating dinner with your family and you stop me to tell me how they're going because you on the side of the street and they're, you know, they pull over, they probably shouldn't pull over in traffic like they do, but they pull over in traffic to tell you how many months they've been sober. And it's such a, you know, a rewarding experience and it makes it worth it to yeah, go back in there every day and try to get that, that next time that you can have somebody yell at you how many months they've been sober. Um, so if we're working ourselves out of a job, we're doing it right. I, I totally agree. There was a, a moment, um, you know, a couple of weeks after the pandemic uh, last March where uh, I was over at the courthouse and I looked across the street at the parking garage and it was completely empty. And that, you know, that thing is always packed. All four levels are, you know, packed with packed with vehicles and you're circling around, circling around. There was nobody in that parking garage and I was looking over there like, man, in a perfect world, this is what this would look like every day. <laughs> that's exactly right. That's exactly right. And that's what we should aspire to do. I mean, of course, the way that the, the, we deal with laws and, and there's, there's going to be a natural, natural thing for folks to continue to break laws and, and we're going to continue to face those. But if we're doing our best job, we're helping someone else different tomorrow than we did today. I love that. Yeah. I think, yeah, I think in, in terms of uh, maybe a good, good place to um, wrap up the conversation, Holden, what would you kind of give as any parting thoughts or suggestions for anybody that feels like they have, you know, a mental health um, issue that they have a substance abuse uh, dependency, just don't, don't feel fulfilled. Don't feel like the, 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 the whistle is gone. What would you suggest in terms of some of the, the resources or life practices out there? Sure. You're not alone. Um, again, when we sit in a room, well, one out of four of us has it. And one of our, out of four of us are dealing with it on a daily basis and, and having to take those inventories and check on ourselves. So there's someone in a room that is statistically likely to be able to have this one-on-one -on -one conversation with you and know what you're going through. Um, but I tell you what, don't wait for the oh crap moment. Um, the oh crap moment is, uh, mine particularly was, I was... Uh, I've been a huge advocate for mental health. I had a best friend in college that, um, that committed suicide. Um, didn't have the life skills at the time to understand what was going on with his life, but um, he had his oh crap moment. And I'll never forget being this huge advocate for mental health and then thinking to myself, oh crap, I'm in really deep trouble here and I don't know how to get myself out. Um, it's a lot deeper when you get down there and you don't know where to go and you're now embarrassed and you don't know who to talk about. This is not an embarrassing topic. This is nothing, nothing different than um, you've got a cold. Um, you got to treat it more aggressively, but it's just like having a cold. You're, you're just as statistically likely. Um, so don't feel alone. Don't feel like you can't talk about it. Um, I'll tell you this, $75 a week to a therapist is the best money you ever spent. They are free to call. Uh, and they do wonderful work and they know what we're going through. Um, and just listen to your friends because for goodness sake, they know what they're talking about and they know what the difference are. Um, and let them, let them be your guide and let them help pull you out of your funk and get you in the right direction moving forward. Yeah, I, I think that speaking it, speaking it out loud is so critical because when you, when you put that out there into the world, when it leaves your when it leaves your mind through your speech, there is something that is freeing about that because your, your, your mind is so good at doing all these mental gymnastics of, okay, things are okay some days and it's, it's going to be fine. And, you know, I, I know that I've, I've had this moment in my own life where, you know, I, I was kind of uh, just, um, you know, doing these mental gymnastics and, you know, th th you know, th things are fine. And then, you know, kind of just spoke out to, to my wife, like, you know, Hey, this is, this is something that I'm going through and the freedom of that, like the, just, just the freedom of being able to talk to another person about whatever it is that's kind of 
bothering you or things that feel off kilter, whether it's a spouse, a, you know, a pastor or a counselor, a friend, the, the freedom that comes from speaking that truth into the world is so powerful because it really does then basically say, you know, I realize I'm not in control of this situation. I'm looking for help. Like I'm, I'm, I'm willing to, to kind of put this out to, to somebody else. So, you know, I, I just piggyback off what you said, just have the courage to, to speak that out to somebody. Got to let the lion out of the cage. T- totally agree. Well, I, um, Otherwise, go, go, go ahead. Hold on. I'm sorry. If you don't, it just, it keeps all the power. And once you get it out of, out of yourself and, and out into the world, especially when you have good friends, they can tell you, don't you know how dumb that sounds? And it, yeah. it really is. It's uh, it's cathartic for sure. Yeah. I mean, yeah. And, that, and I, I think that, you know, when you, we all know that we have people that will support us no matter what we're going through. And so the fact that we, you know, say, say something, you know, to them about kind of where our, our mental health is, you know, if we have a um, dependency issue or whatever it might be, there are people out there that are, are ready, willing, and able to help us. They're, they're not there to, to kind of judge and, 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 you know, throw us under the bus. I mean, we've all got, we've all got people that are around us to support us. We just got to lean into that support. Um, but I, I, I uh, can't thank you enough, Holden, for coming on and talking about this important uh, issue. Um, I know that for, for anybody that needs somebody to talk to about this, obviously feel free to contact um, uh, Holden or I. I would say that, uh, that Holden in particular is somebody that is a great person um, to talk to, uh, has a passion for helping people with this situation, is a, a very understanding of the resources that are available to attorneys that are going through difficult mental health um, situations, uh, dependency issues. So if you, if you need somebody to talk to and you don't have somebody that you want to lean on or you just don't feel comfortable talking about this with a, a family member or friend, um, uh, give myself a call, but maybe you're going to get better help giving, giving Holden the call and talking to him about your uh, situation. So I know, know Holden would be happy to talk to you about it. Absolutely. I appreciate you. I appreciate the platform. Um, again, speaking it out and getting it out in the world. Uh, um, it's Mental Health Awareness Month that we talked about. Appreciate that you're t- tackling this topic during this month. Um, uh, you know, absolutely, Holden. I think that this podcast will probably air after uh, after Mental Health Awareness Month has ended. But hey, we we recorded it during Mental Health Awareness Month. So that's that, right. That's, that, that, that's all that matters. <laughs> well, well, sounds good, Holden. Well, if there's uh, uh, anybody that needs to to reach out, then certainly um, uh, feel free to do that. And appreciate you coming on. Thank you so much. If you found the information in this podcast to be valuable. I simply ask that you pay it forward and share this podcast with another member of the legal community. Also, if you would leave us a rating or a review on whatever platform you are listening on, I would greatly appreciate it.